take a minute. I want you to brainstorm and tell me what were two of the most important topics we've learned about in the past week. It's your ability, oh sorry, it's your impression, your opinion. What is the two most important topics we covered and learned about last week? Think back, take a look back at your notes. Thank you. 
Okay, 68 points up there. Why in between plus and minus 2? 95. 95%. So what is the area, if here's minus 2, what is this area in this lower tail? 5.5. I mean, okay. And the area in the upper tail between plus 2 and infinity is another 2.5%. So 95% of the data lie between plus and minus 2 sigma if they're normally distributed. And then if they're normally distributed. So do a QQ plot first and then confirm that it's normally distributed. So those are the most important concepts in my mind and obviously in yours as well for our mastery. Let's read from our. Um, Take off where we left off on um, Thursday's class. Thursday's class, we looked at the central limit theorem and we said, well, if we take the sample of x1, 2, 3, up to n, so n samples are taken, we compute the average, that average now, x bar, okay, is going to be itself normally distributed. This was the new, the new point we learned last Thursday. That x bar is itself going to be normally distributed, and the variance of that x bar is as if it comes from a normal distribution of mean of u and various sigma squared of n. Now, emphasize here that that mu and that sigma are the mu and sigma, the mean and standard deviation of this distribution, which you don't actually know. So every data set you will acquire from an actual process in practice will have the distribution of finite variance. Okay, so I, I'm guaranteeing you that. We don't work with distributions with infinite variance. So if you go to a chemical process and you don't really know the data you're acquiring, but let's say the data comes from a distribution that looks like that. So that distribution, whatever it might be, will have a mean of u and will have standard deviation sigma. Okay, every statistical distribution will have that. If you take five samples, let's say n, lowercase n is equal to five, take those five samples and you calculate x bar, x bar will be from a normal distribution with mean of u and various sigma squared of n. Samples, they put them through a machine and get nine viscosity values. 
Those are the nine viscosity values. We calculate the mean. The average viscosity value is 20. The standard deviation viscosity value is 3. Now suspend reality here for this example, and let's pretend we actually know what the true standard deviation is. We never know this in practice, but let's just for the illustration assume that we know our true sigma from this population is 3.5. So we've now calculated this new average, 20. And what we're saying then, the central limit theorem is saying is that that average x bar, that 20, is as if it's a sample from a normal distribution with the mean of u, we don't know, and variance sigma squared over here. So it's as if x bar comes from that distribution. And what we can go do is we can go create a z value for x bar. Now this seems a little bit weird. Why are we creating a z value for x bar? Well, you can see where this is leading. Remember all that a z value says is take your, your variable x, subtract off the mean, and divide through by a standard deviation. Okay, you can use any mean you like over there, you use any standard deviation you like. But that principle of scaling and centering is to create z. So well, let's say, well, what if my variable x I'm not interested in my raw data x, but let me say, I'm going to plug in there that x bar. That's a variable as well. Why do I say x bar is a variable? Well, think of it this way. If I repeat that experiment on another plastic brick two days later, I'm going to get nine different values. So nine new values up there. I'm going to get a different x bar. I'm going to get another sample. So x bar is itself a variable. So we can legitimately create a z value for x bar. We're going to do that down here. And our whole goal in today's class is to find what we call a confidence interval. And all that a confidence interval does, now notice very carefully what, what's in the middle here. The confidence interval simply says mu lies between some lower bound and upper bound. And I'm going to tell you that u is 17.7 and 23.3 for this particular data set. Okay, so our whole goal in today's class is understanding why u and how did I get 17.7 and 23? That's our aim in today's class. Let's answer the first question right away. Why u? U is in that confidence interval. Why do we want the confidence interval to mu. Well, mu is unknown. We will never know mu. Right? We can never know the population. We said for back last week, the population parameters are never known to us. So the best what we can do is try to find bounds within which we expect mu to be. And that's all that a confidence interval is. So a confidence interval is for mu. We do not write x bar lies between some lower bound and some upper bound. Okay? That's wrong. You don't do this. Confidence interval is only for you, it's not for x bar. Okay? So it's wrong to say to your boss or someone afterwards, well, the average viscosity is 20 with a lower bound of 17.7 and 23. Because the confidence interval isn't for x bar. We know what x bar is, we don't need a confidence interval. All we want is a confidence interval for mu, the true mean which we actually never know. So that's our goal is to calculate that confidence interval and it's always for mu. So how do we do this? Well, here's, here's how we do it. Notice that in this equation down here, we know what x bar is, we know what sigma is. I'm pretending we know what sigma is for now, we know what n is, we took nine samples. Okay, so it's related to manipulating this expression how we get the confidence. So let's take a look at that. And to understand what that is, we have to go back and recall the cumulative distribution. I'd say the start of the class is an important one today. So let's take a look at the cumulative distribution. We considered this last week. And we said, well, this vertical axis here is the cumulative area. And if I read across and then down, I can find the corresponding z value. So what's this doing? That's the cumulative distribution. 
the original distribution where that came from is this drawing over here on this wall. Now consider for a minute the following. If I calculate the z value for that viscosity problem, and I told you the z value was minus 3. So you've got a z value of minus 3. What's the probability of you getting z value of minus 3? What's the probability of getting a z value of zero? You've got a 50% chance of getting a z value of zero or lower. So essentially, the cumulative distribution is telling you what are the chances of you getting the z value. That's where our confidence interval comes in. So if we're constructing a 95% confidence interval, we're saying cut off the two tails, 2.5% here, and cut off two and a half percent there, and you're going to get z values that lie between that region. Okay. And so a confidence interval says we know that mu is somewhere along this axis. Now we don't work with mu anymore. What we worked with is z, and z is equal to x bar minus mu. I want a 95% confidence interval, it's said that I expect to be within this region excluding the tails. So how do I find that it's low around the plus? Well, they're not exactly plus or minus two. Remember we had said at the start of class that that's a good rule of thumb. The exact value is plus or minus 1.96. How do I get plus or minus 1.96? Well, I use the Q norm function. Q in R is what tells you how to do this. So let's say I want the Q norm. If I've got 95% confidence interval, that's, that's 5% that's left over. Split the difference, so 2.5% in the lower tail, 2.5% in the upper tail, and then put Q norm of 1 minus 5% divided by 2. In other words, 97.5. So let me just show that to you in R. Uh, so Q norm. 0.975 is 1.96. It's symmetrical as well. So 2.5%, in other words, 0 0.025, what's the value going to be for that? Minus 1.96. Okay, so if I want 2.5% in either of my tails, my z value must be between minus 1.95 and plus 1.95. That bound will contain 95% of the area. Does that make sense? Make sure you understand what QNOM is doing. Don't just use the software, you know, routine you have. Okay, and this, um, this diagram over here is telling you what QNOM does. So, session 1.5, your 97.5 of the area is find the Z value. It wants 2.5% to find the Z value. And that's the balance within which we expect to find our z. Okay, so if z lies between plus and minus 1.96, so we'll use this new notation, c subscript a. The reason why it's a c is it's the critical value from the normal distribution. We're going to see ct later on from the t distribution. cn is the critical value from the normal distribution. So my z will lie between plus and minus 1.96. If you're doing back of the hand calculation on an envelope, just use plus or minus two. If you've got your computer, plug in one point nine six. So now we have that z value. Let's plug it in over there. And that's what I've done over here on the slide next is plug in my expression for z. Recall back to grade ten high school math where you work with inequalities. Total it around, and you can find and solve for you. Or we want just mu in the middle, low bound and upper bound. So, what is the first thing you notice about the low bound and upper bound values? If you look at those two expressions on the left, that's my low bound, there's my expression for the upper bound. What do you notice? It's symmetrical. Right? If you have the lower bound, the upper bound is exactly the same distance from 
part from here to this one. So that's our 95% confidence. That's all there is to it. Okay, this class is over. But let's, let's dig in a little bit more and actually understand what's, what's going on. Yeah, Z is unknown. Yeah, that doesn't be the slide. So Z is unknown because we don't know Right, so we never know the true you. Okay? But what we're doing is we're saying we know the downs for you. But we can never actually calculate our actions at value. Okay, so if you do that process with that data set, you'll calculate and prove to yourself that the lower bound is 72 times 22. We call this data set. If I take nine new samples from the lab, what is going to be my lower bound number? Confident. 
What's your balance there? Plus or minus infinity, right? If you want to be 100% confident, the only bound is between minus infinity and plus infinity. And so it's a useless to be 100% confident. But if you change your level of confidence, you can shrink that bound. So be careful of this. The statisticians will use this to their advantage to make things confident. They'll go to a different level of confidence until nothing work out. Okay, so how to apply with statistics? There's one easy way. Change your CN value to get this to show a value that you want to see. So, important that you understand the interpretation of confidence. Increasing your number of samples will narrow your bound. Decreasing your level of confidence will make your bound narrow as well. We haven't spoken yet about the one elephant in the room up there, and that's sigma. We assume we know sigma. And here's one thing I want you to remember. If you work with any statistical tool that tells you you need to know sigma, you need to throw that tool away. It's no good. We never know sigma. Think of it this way. How can you practically know sigma but not know what mu is? Right? After all, the confidence interval is defined bounds for mu. So how can you find a bound for mu? In other words, say you don't know what mu is, but how can you actually know what sigma is? It doesn't make any sense to know what the variance is if you don't know the mean or rate. Okay, so any practical statistical method cannot rely on you knowing what sigma is. So we recognize that and so we modify the statistical method. So what the statistical modification is, well, let's not know sigma. We can estimate sigma pretty well. We can use the standard deviation as a way to estimate sigma. Well, if we estimate sigma now, we've got to use an S in there. So that's an easy change to make. But then unfortunately where there's one drawback, the moment we shove S into there and not sigma, Z isn't normally distributed anymore. So previously Z was normally distributed when we knew what sigma is. If we don't know sigma and we use S instead, Z is now T distributed. Well, we're not quite done yet. Okay, so Z is now T distributed. There's one other assumption we have to make, unfortunately. Unfortunately, also to have Z following the T distribution, our other assumption is that the raw data, Xi, those individual line samples we took of the viscosity, the raw data must also be normally distributed. Previously, we said that the normal, the data can be from any distribution, as long as we take them independently. Now we're saying, uh, that's unfortunate. We have to go to xi being normally distributed. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two is replace sigma with s. And then t will be, uh, z will be t distributed. Okay. So is that a restrictive assumption? Well, probably not, because you can always test out on the normal distribution. We showed you last week how to do that. That was the purpose of learning about the QQ plot last, last Thursday. Now you've got a great tool, a really easy tool. You go to R, you tap QQ plot, give it the data, and it will immediately show you whether the data are normally distributed or not. So really straightforward to test this assumption. So never in this course will I give you a method that requires assumptions that I don't also give you the tool to test that assumption. So we've got an easy tool to test that assumption with the XI now on the Just think of how the median is calculated, right? It's a 
It's a non-linear calculation. Okay, so now the Z is T distributed because the only way we can make that change of putting in sigma to S and the raw data being more distributed, that now means that Z is T distributed. So there's a derivation for that. Right? This course, I you notice I don't focus on any of the statistical derivations. But any classical stats will show that derivation uh, of students' T derivation. Okay? So let's learn about the T distribution quickly. The T distribution is on that table that I handed out to you last time. The, on the lower half of the page of the T distribution. Now notice what, how it looks. Compared to the normal distribution, it's almost identical. Is the one that the thinner line, the normal distribution is the thicker line. We say the T distribution has heavier tailwinds. That's the classical description of the T distribution. T distribution, we say, is heavier tails because the probability of getting a value in the tail is higher. So the area under that curve is still 1, so in order to keep that area equal to 1, that is keep the T distribution slightly lower than those are the only two differences. There's one other thing we have to know about the T distribution, is it depends on a parameter, which we call the degrees of freedom. The DF in R is what it's used. The degrees of freedom is a number, U, or lower than this Greek V, that tells me the degrees of freedom is N minus 1. The reason for that is because we consume a degree of freedom in order to calculate the standard deviation. So the standard deviation Calculate it requires you to calculate x bar, and then you consume one degree of freedom by doing that. So the t distribution is defined by this one degree of freedom. Let's talk about r a bit here quickly. In r, we use the function q norm to find the critical limits for the normal distribution. So just to point out a little bit about the way of thinking of r, so when you use it, it's not uh, surprising to you. So in R, if you use the function Q norm, you're going to get the quantile Q from the normal distribution. So look back to the slide where we use Q norm. We use Q norm to find a plus or minus 1.96. So we'll go back here. Q norm put in 0 0.025 and you're going to get minus 1.96. So Q norm of 0.975 and you're going to get the same number. Now, on the T distribution, the function that you use in R is going to be, no surprise, QT. Again, one the quantile from the T distribution. Now, there's one thing. Remember I said the T distribution has this parameter, the degrees of freedom. So you're going to not only, like in R, you can say R of Q norm 0.975, you're going to get your answer. In R, if you say QT of 0.975, you're not going to get an answer, you're going to get an error, because you need to tell us the degrees of freedom is equal to N minus 1. So you need to tell R what that parameter is in order for to get the QT value. It's safest to write the number because there's other parameters that the, that the function can take on. Okay. So it's not like MATLAB, where MATLAB respects the order of the inputs. R, we can supply your arguments in any order. Okay. And so we usually prefix our arguments with the, merit, with the name of the variable. Okay. Notice that Q norm, while we're talking about R, Q norm also actually has some implicit inputs. So if you go to Q norm, Q norm actually has implicit inputs of specifying the mean at zero and standard deviation at one. So if you find the quantile from the normal distribution is centered at zero and standard deviation at one, which is what Z happens to be. QT, same idea, you do QT. You can give, give the, the, the variable or the level where you want to find QT and then the degrees of freedom. And there's a few other inputs that you can do there. So let's go back 
to the T distribution. Uh, 600 level students will have an assignment question where you, where you prove to yourself the difference between the normal distribution and the T distribution. But one thing I want you to get from this picture up here is the similarity of it. Okay? And this curve between T and normal distribution very quickly starts to overlap when you get more than about 8 to 10 degrees of freedom. The curves really only differ when your degrees of freedom are small. In other words, if you're taking a very small sample size, then the use of the T distribution is important. For large samples, the difference between T and normal distribution is pretty negligible. Which is what most of the cases are going to be for engineers. You can have many degrees of freedom, so the practical difference is very, very small. But we are being serious about this in a statistical way, so let's use the correct notation. We have to use the T distribution, because who knows, in the future some of you might deal with a small sample size, and you don't want to be misled by using the normal distribution. Okay, so now we've got that under our belt. Let's uh, continue on with the T distribution. So let's repeat the same, the same algorithm. We've got my Z values, X bar minus mu, divided by S this time over root n. That Z comes from the T distribution with 8 degrees of freedom. So N equals 9 samples. Z now comes from the T distribution with 8 degrees of freedom. Check that the raw data follow the normal distribution. I know that you follow the normal distribution because I've checked it. And you've in fact seen, seen it already. These data that we looked up way back last week those are those nine data points. So they're exactly repeated here. Those are the normal distribution. I've just bumped them around a bit. But they are normal distributed. Okay, so we, but you will in practice always check that with the Q plot function. Step four is find the lower bounds and upper bounds for the interval that contains 95% of the text. So here's where that QT function comes in. And notice how the bounds are wider. They're minus 2.31 and plus 2.31. So previously we were at 1.96. Now we're bumped a little bit further. Our confidence interval has gone a little wider. This is important. When you go from that, the previous case was when we knew sigma. Now we don't know sigma. The corresponding price we pay for that is an increase in our confidence interval. So that, that widens up that. Okay, and then the rest of it is just substituting in. We know CT, we know S, we know root N. This now is far more realistic in our case, and you can find the wrong number. Okay. Yes, this is important. Um, it's very easy to mess this up. This denominator is root N, it's not your degrees of freedom. Sometimes people will sub in 8 over there, it's not. We had 9 samples, so the denominator is. You only use 8 to calculate the degrees of freedom for the T distribution. Okay, so notice here what's happened to the confidence interval. This first case where we had this unrealistic assumption of lowering sigma, we were between 17.7 and 22.3. Now the confidence interval is a little bit broader by about 27 units. Okay, so here's, here's why I want you to, to think about the comments. We're going to use this in the next class substantially. But I would argue in many cases the confidence interval is actually a whole lot easier to use than a simple statement of an error. So for example, if someone tells you the confidence interval has a lower bound of 429 parts per million for impurity and 673 is an upper bound, it looks a little bit overwhelming initially to give bounds for a number. And they're saying that that's the 95% bound. From what you have just learned about confidence interval, how do you feel about that low bound and upper bound? What's it telling you?
you know, one thing I want you to get from it is give you an idea of the spread. So to see a low down of 429 and 673, you're getting a great idea of how it's spread out later on. You don't know that the where the true mean actually is. We, but we're getting a good idea of the level of spread of the raw data. 95% of the time, my true mean is going to lie between 429 and 673. Okay. We can easily recover the sample mean very, very easy because this boundary is symmetrical. Take the midpoint between 429 and 673, and that's your mean. So this is far more informative. You can also recover the original information on the mean. You can also get a really easy idea of the standard deviation. So I said it gives you an idea of the spread, 429 to 673. You've got a good idea in engineering units what the spans. If someone tells you my variance sigma squared is such and such. That's really, really difficult to interpret. We, we cannot interpret square units very easily. But a standard deviation or a spread back in the original units is far more interpretable and practical. So we can easily get and recover back from the standard deviation from a simple back calculation through a confidence interval. So our preference in this course in understanding data systems is to use a confidence interval because it carries a wealth of information very well. So I'd like you to, to work through these and make sure you understand where I calculated these numbers from uh, to make sure that you understand these things correct. So this is just a summary of that, uh, these last two slides. And I want to just point out some key points here in the last few minutes. There's a lot of words here, but let's, we've already covered this to some extent. The one thing I do want to strongly emphasize, and this might be especially um, take you a minute or two to pick up on it if English is not your first language, and it's because of the very subtle difference here of a confidence interval and potentially how you work it incorrectly in the past. So a confidence interval, compare these two sentences, they look very similar, but they're actually very different meanings. It is the probability that the confidence interval range contains the true viscosity. However, it's not the probability that the true viscosity is within the given range. So it looks like I've just flipped the sentence around, but there's a subtle difference there, and the, the meaning has changed dramatically. And the reason is the second one is wrong is quite simple. The probability that the population viscosity mu is such and such. We don't have probabilities associated with mu. Mu doesn't have any probability. We know, if we knew mu, we know it with 100% accuracy. Mu is a population parameter. So population parameters don't have probabilities associated. All we're finding, however, is the probability that the range contains the true population parameter. The subtle difference that's incorrect, and this is how people often, often interpret it wrongly, is to say it's the probability that the true viscosity is There is a difference between those two sentences. One important other way that you can understand the confidence interval is as follows. Is if you have a graduate student doing work for you in the lab, and you tell them to do an experiment 10 times and calculate the average and calculate the confidence interval, they're going to calculate the lower bound and upper bound from those 10 experiments. Then you send that graduate student back to the lab to repeat the experiment. They get another 10 data points. They calculate the lower bound and an upper bound. Then you send them back and they do another set of experiments. They calculate the lower bound and an upper bound. Notice that those are a different width every time. Why are they a different width? doing 10 experiments every time, but the same CT value, why is the bound shrinking? Maybe the person is getting more experience with data, with the data with the system. The key is that 
these bounds are a function of the raw data, they're a function of S, the standard deviation. So every time you repeat this experiment, those 10 data points, you get a different standard deviation. So that length changes of the bound. So they, they do another 10 experiments, they get another lower bound and upper bound. Then they do another 10 experiments, they get a lower bound and upper bound. And what if I told you the true mean was here? That's true mean. What a 95% confidence interval says, 95 tells you 95% of the time, or in other words, 19 times out of 20, it's the same thing. 19 times out of 20, that bound will contain a true mean. If you repeat this 20 times, so here I've shown 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you go through 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 20, 19 of those bounds will contain the true mean, one of them won't. That's what a 95% confidence interval is. So to come back to this point, is the probability that the range contains the true viscosity? 95% of the time that range will contain the viscosity. It's not that the probability of the true viscosity is within the range. And you might be tempted to skip that rate, say the true viscosity is within the range 95% of the time. That's not true because the true viscosity in the population parameter is known in the hundreds of so We just don't know it, but there's no probability associated. This is a really critical and subtle point to be Okay, this slide over here talks a bit about something we've seen before. It says that as our confidence level increases, so we go from 90 to 95 to 99% confidence, for example. Notice what's happening here to the lower bound and upper bound. They're getting further and further apart. So in other words, that range between the lower bound and upper bound gets broader. So if you have a higher level of confidence, your range gets wider and wider. You cannot be 100% confident because that would be the human range. Finally, the, the last important point is about N. As you increase the number of experiments, the confidence interval range will, will narrow up, but there's diminishing returns because of the square root of the So, any questions on this? So next class we'll take this a step further and start to look at experiments.